Um, Dr. Hader, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I have your PowerPoint on my end. So right. just let me know anytime you want me to advance to the next slide. Sure, sure. All right, okay, thank you so much. All right, so thank you so much for attending this. Uh, let me just get situated here. So I don't have too many slides, but uh, the, the purpose of presenting this is to, especially for primary care physicians, um, nurse practitioners, family medicine physicians, to get themselves familiar with this medication, especially with the, the increase in obesity and the insulin resistance. Uh, I think this insulin has a role uh, in some of the patient population that we manage, the family practitioners, and you know, manage, because I think the um, uh, certainly in this state with obesity, uh, there is a very important role uh, for this insulin. And and if we you know get familiar with the using it, I think we can help our patient population. So what I want to achieve, if we can uh, advance the slide. What I want to do in the next maybe 30 minutes is to do the following. Uh, and these are my learning objectives also for today, is to number one, identify candidates. Not everyone needs to be on this insulin. Um, so identify uh, patients who will benefit, who are likely to benefit from this, um, uh, you using this insulin. Um, and then how is this insulin different, similar and different? So. Uh, from some of the insulins that we are very familiar with and we use often. So we will, we will talk about its pharmacokinetics and dynamics. How does it work and how it gets, it gets absorbed? How long it takes for the medication to get up in the system? Um, so, so we'll discuss about that. And then if we have a patient who is on insulin on U100, then how we can use or start this insulin. So identify the patient, then discuss what to discuss, what to expect, and what to tell the patient in terms of benefits. And then I have a case, it's a clinical case, so he, uh, this patient follows with me in the clinic, so we will actually put into practice what we will discuss uh, in the next, in the, you know, um, uh, before, uh, before this case. So we will talk about the data and then we will practice using this insulin, uh, using this uh, case that I have, uh, I follow in the clinic. All right, at any point, if you have any questions, uh, again, I don't have too many slides, so you can stop me and I'll be happy to answer questions. All right, if we can advance the slide. Okay, so uh, just uh, some few words uh, about its introduction. Uh, this uh, U500 insulin is a product of Eli Lilly product. Uh, it is, the U500, it is regular insulin, the R insulin, you know, the, that we are very familiar with. We use it in um, our, our patients. Um, uh, very often. So this insulin, the U500, is actually regular insulin. However, it is five times more potent. And this is very important, and I want to emphasize and explain this point in detail because that's where this insulin is a little, you know, people think that if you're giving them U500, we are there on a very concentrated insulin and they're going to run low and it's going to cause hypoglycemia. However, it is concentrated, it is five times more potent, but if we are familiar with this insulin, then really, as long as we're giving the right doses, that should not happen. And that's the uh, thing I want to um, achieve with, the, with this presentation today, especially for primary care physicians and nurse practitioners. Okay, so what does that mean, um, that this, this is five times more potent? So this means that one ml, if you draw out one ml of this U500 insulin, it will contain 500 units of insulin. This is in comparison with the regular U100 insulin, the regular, the R insulin, the Humulin R that we use, that it's the one, the one ml of U100 R insulin contains 100 units. If we can advance the slide, we'll see some pictures. And so the, the circle, the pen with the circle, you see this is U100 insulin. So that has, suppose this contains one ml or 100 units. If you can put another click, click it again, please. Yeah, again, click. All right, so this means that this pen here contains one ml and or contains 100 units of insulin. Now in con contrast that, if, if we can click again a couple of times, please. One more time, all right. So contrast that, this U100, one ml, which contains 100 units, to the U500 insulin. 
It is our insulin, same insulin, but it is five times more concentrated. So you see here, the same amount of insulin or the 100 units of insulin is present in this pen, uh, in this uh, you know, pen of U uh, of humulin R, but look at the volume. The biggest difference is the volume. The same 100 units of insulin can be given by just given, giving 0.2 or one fifth of the volume of the U100 insulin. So if your patient is using, uh, say this is 100 units of R insulin, then we can give the same insulin, same amount of insulin, same 100 units, but by giving only 20% of the volume. So in this case, it will be 0.2 ml. Now, if you see here, if your patient is using a lot of insulin, a lot of insulin, the volume can be reduced by using the U500 insulin or Humulin R. And this becomes really important. Those of us who prescribe insulin in clinical practice, we ask our patients sometimes, what if suppose they're using 180 units or 100 units of Lentis insulin. They will tell us sometimes, especially if they have obesity, that when they inject, some of the insulin actually leaks out. It comes back out. So the first thing is that are they taking, are they you know, able to absorb all the insulin? And all the insulin that was studied, especially the U100 insulin, was studied in a lower doses, 50 units or less. So we know that if you have a giving a very high volume, one, the absorption will be the issue. Two, the pharmacokinetics, it may not solve, you know, follow the same absorption pattern that a lower dose will follow. So the dose of insulin becomes important. So when we are, we have a patient who is using a lot of insulin, a lot of insulin, and we will talk about it, then reducing the volume and using this concentrated insulin, which is the U500 insulin, will overcome the volume issue. And therefore, once the volume, the patient is injecting less volume, there will be less leakage, number one. Number two, the insulin will follow the normal pharmacokinetics um, and it will not cause so much pain at the site of injection because the volume is less and the absorption will be better. So again, the volume, one fifth or 20%, the volume that the U100 insulin, uh, that the patient will inject when they're using what U100 insulin. So I think this is the most important thing. And we will um, you know, talk about it more when we talk about the, selecting the right patient. Next slide, please. So historical overview, and this is very interesting. The U500 insulin initially was marketed and came into clinical practice just 30 years after the insulin was diagnosed. Uh, it was discovered, I should say. So the insulin was discovered, isolated, and it came into uh, use in clinical practice in the early 1920s. Within 30 years, there was a need to use concentrated insulin. However, the reason for that was back then, it was we were using the beef and the pork insulin. So the human, you know, the, um, the patients were actually developing antibodies against the insulin. So these antibodies were caused, were, were neutralizing some of the insulin and therefore patients were needing more and more insulin. And that's when the, the need to give more concentrated insulin was felt. And that's when U500 is not, you know, was first used in clinical practice in 1952. However, in 1982, the recombinant DNA human insulin came um, you know, the production increased and then the beef and the pork insulin was no longer used. So the antibody related product, you know, problems were not, and we don't encounter it now in clinical practice. You know, patients who were alive back then, like Taekwans who had exposure to those beef and pork insulin, sure, they can have insulin antibodies, but, but not the patients who are, who were never exposed to these insulins. So it was used in clinical practice. It was used um, you know, often uh, because of the antibody related issue. However, in, uh, since 1982, the production really went down and the use uh, in clinical practice went down as well. Until uh, uh, you know, in the last maybe 30 years, because of the epidemic of obesity and the insulin resistance, um, then the, the population in North America and all over the, you know, the world for that matter, the obesity increased, and with obesity, there was more insulin resistance, and and and, and the and the need and um, the clinical use application of U500 increased again, but for a different reason. So initially, 
in the 1950s, insulin resistance, antibody production, now obesity, insulin resistance, morbid obesity, and so it is the main reason that we consider this. Next slide, please. All right, so what is insulin resistance? You know, when, I, when, when, when should we suspect that the patient has insulin resistance? And, when, and I think this will help us identify the patient that will or can benefit from uh, the use of U500 insulin. So you, I have some pictures here, and these are some of the things that when, that when we meet uh, these uh, type two diabetics, we look for. So in the first slide, you see, um, this is the neck, and you see a lot of dark pigmentation, black color area, uh, that circles around the neck. So this is your acanthosis migricans, and this represents insulin resistance. Insulin is like a growth hormone. So if the patient's body is making a lot of insulin, um, because but it cannot act on the receptors or the receptors are downregulated, because it's a growth hormone, it will cause hyperproliferation or keratinization of the skin cells, uh, keratinocytes. And that's where this, this dark pigmentation, this and if you feel it, it will have a velvety, hyperplastic uh, feel to it. Uh, and that's because the insulin that the body is trying to make will cause this dark pigmentation and, and this discoloration in the neck area. On the second picture, you see a lot of skin tags uh, actually. And this again is the neck area. Um, and, and some patients with insulin resistance will develop these and they can develop on the neck area and the, on the armpits, groin area where there's a lot of friction. Um, uh, that's where we will uh, notice them. So all we have to do is just ask the patient to look around, to stretch the neck, hyperextend the neck, and we can see these uh, these growths. And if you have them, if your patient has them, uh, then this will indicate increased insulin resistance. And then the hirsutism. This is a female picture of a female, and you see here there's some hair growth on the upper lip, just like your PCOS uh, patients, because they have insulin resistance and some hair growth in the chin area, terminal hair development, and uh, other things can develop. So these are, you know, some of the things that we can look for uh, to see if our patient is showing signs of insulin resistance. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so U500 insulin, this insulin, this concentrated insulin where the volume is less, it is available in two, um, you, you can prescribe it uh, two different ways. One is a pen. Uh, you see the pen in the blue and this contains, a, it comes in an increments of five. So it, you, you know, they can give 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, so on and so forth. It's very convenient, just like any other pen. You dial the dose and you inject. Now, if the patient is injecting 100 units, that means it's 100 units. So, um, you know, it's not that you have to do any math or any calculation. It's very simple. You just give the dose, take 100 units or 150 units. And again, this will become clear when we will talk about the case. So that's one way, easiest way, very convenient. Patients really like it. The other way is using it through a vial. And, and I want to highlight this. When we prescribe this vial, we prescribe this different syringe, which is the, the syringe has a green top. Can you click one more time, please? I want to show something. Click, yeah. So this is different than the U100 syringe. The U100 syringe, has an orange cap. So when we prescribe a vial, for example, for any reason, the insurance is not covering the pen, then we prescribe the, uh, our patients the U500 vial, and we tell them that, look, do not use that orange, the U100 syringe, you have to use the green syringe or the U500 syringe. And if they're using this combination of green, so the bottle has a green cap and the uh, needle has a green um, uh, you know, cap as well, then all they have to do is to just take out the amount of insulin. They don't have to do any math. They don't have to you know, calculate the volume themselves or divide it by five or anything. But you have to prescribe, we have to be very, very clear to the patient that use the green top vial and the green top needle. And again, if you're prescribing say 100 units, you ask the patient to draw out 100 units and inject 100 units before meals. Now, if you're, for any reason, the patient is using the U100 syringe, then you have to divide the dose by five. So if, suppose if the patient, you, you want to prescribe, say, uh, 100 units, but they will draw out 100 divided by five because the volume is only 20% and they will still deliver the same dose. I want to just prevent and you know, avoid any confusion. So I think in the, when, when you are prescribing this insulin, it's better to either prescribe pen or 
the, 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 the green vial and the green syringe, which is the U500 syringe. If the patient cannot for any reason uh, use it, then what we sometimes do, we use the U100, the orange cap syringe, but divide the dose. So whatever dose we want to give them, we ask them to draw out only. So suppose we want to prescribe 100 units. So we ask the patient to just do 100 divided by five, which will be what? 20. So 20 units on the U100 syringe and inject it. But uh, you know, um, if you want to avoid the confusions and then just stick to the pen and the green top and the green syringe. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's the U100 syringe. Okay, now I, identifying the patients that will benefit from this. So, um, so when we are seeing patients in the clinic, we look for a few things. If our patient uh, patients uh, is, is the patient is using more than two grams per day, the two grams sorry two units per kilogram daily dose consistently. So for example, if the patient is hundred kilogram, the way he weighs he or she weighs hundred kilogram, and so that means two hundred and twenty pounds, and the patient's regimen is this. He's taking 80 units of Lentis two times a day, which is 160 units right there, and 35 units before each meal. Then the total daily dose that this patient is consistently taking is 265 units. So clearly this patient is using more than 200 units on a daily basis. Since he weighs 100 kilograms, so that means he's using almost 2.65 units per kilogram per day. So anyone who is using more than 200 units of insulin daily, all insulin, the basal insulin, bolus insulin combined, or their, um, their insulin requirement is more than two units per kilogram per day. That means the patient is using a lot of insulin. The volume is high and they, those are the patients where U500 insulin can be used. Now, some patients will be on certain medications. And I'm just highlighting some of the medications. So if they're using high-dose steroids, which will cause insulin resistance, sometimes your transplant patients who are using the transplant medications like um, a Prograf or Tecrolimus, Cyclosporin, um, uh, they will develop insulin resistance because these medications increase insulin resistance. HIV medications by causing lipodystrophy uh, will also cause the insulin resistance. And some of your newer uh, antipsychotic medications, uh, Latuda um, um, and other medications, they can cause metabolic syndrome. And so these patients will have insulin resistance and require. So look at the medication list, see why they have insulin resistance, why they're needing so much insulin. Is it medication? Because then medication, maybe you, you can look at other options. Um, so uh, the important thing to remember on this slide is how much insulin in a day consistently they're using. Is it more than 200 units per day? or is it more than two units per kilogram per day? All right, next slide, please. All right, can you click a couple of times? I just, I had not one more, one more, uh, one more. Oh no, back again. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so I said that this is a U, uh, this is regular insulin. The U500 insulin is regular insulin, but it is more concentrated. However, if you look at the pharmacokinetics, how it works by making the insulin, you know, by decreasing the volume, this insulin works slightly differently than our U100 or the humulin R U100. So if you see here, this, this slide right here, the patient is injecting at time zero, injecting the insulin. And within about maybe 30, 35, 40 minutes, you start to see the levels of insulin rising in blood. And then if you see here, it peaks in around three hours, uh, three hours after the injection. And then there is a, a bit of a plateau between three to maybe five to six hours. And then there is a lot of tailing. So the insulin is slowly getting a bit, you know, uh, out of the system. Now, this is different than the U100 insulin. The U100 insulin is really a six to maybe eight hour insulin. So here, if we ask our patients to use this insulin 30 minutes before meal, so this insulin, the U500 insulin, will work both as a bolus insulin as well as a basal insulin. So its pharmacokinetics is almost like NPH insulin. It lasts in the system about 12, maybe 14 hours, and it will start getting, you know, be present in the bloodstream within 30 minutes. So therefore, if we want someone to use the U500 insulin, 
we can just stop all other insulin, the, U, the, the, the basal insulin and the bolus insulin. But importantly, ask our patients to use this U500 insulin, concentrated insulin, 30 minutes prior to meal so that it can work both as a bolus insulin and as well as the basal insulin. So if you see here, and this is where this insulin has an advantage. For example, in the example, in the last, uh, when I was talking about this patient who was taking 80 units, two times a day of Lentis and 35 units before every meal. So those are five injections. If a patient has to take five injections every single day, plus all the other medication, then there is a very good chance that they may be missing some of these injections. And so if you switch this, these patients to um, the, the, the U100, U, sorry, U500 insulin, then you can get away with three injections, sometimes two injections. And that's where the patients like using this insulin. Their compliance, adherence to your treatment plan improves. And we will see some slides as to how, it, how that can benefit uh, these patients in the long, uh, long term. Please click. All right. So this is just some data and, and this is sometimes we discuss with our patients. So this was a study done. I don't want to spend too much time, but I just want to highlight this. So these about nine studies where patients were using multiple daily injections. So that means your basal insulin and the pre-meal insulin, these patients were using in nine studies. So the total number of patients were 310. And when they were switched from the U100 insulin to this concentrated U500 insulin, average, there was a reduction in A1C of about almost 1.6%, 1.6%. So if we started from say A1C of 11, it came down to nine and a half or 9.4. I'm just giving an example. So just by switching, we're not increasing the insulin, we're switching, so less injection, improvement in A1C. So that's one thing that will, will happen. So that's to the patient's advantage, less in insulin, less injections, improvements in A1C. However, there was weight gain associated in, in these patients on an average uh, in, 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 in about six months period, they gain almost four and a half kilograms, which is close to 10 pounds. Now, most patients will not like it, but it makes a lot of sense. Anytime you improve glycemic control, the patients are not urinating a lot. So they are not peeing calories. They now they are retaining it. And that's probably one of the reasons for the weight gain. And I will come back to this point uh, when I give the example of the case that I have um, as to how you can counsel patients and, and, and tell them that this can potentially happen, but this is not a bad sign. And there are other strategies we can do to avoid weight gain. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is, how do we dose U500 insulin? So we, when we are dosing, so here we, are to, we will talk about how to convert our patients. So they are on U100 insulin, they are on Lantis, commonly used insulin or Bezeglar or, or anything. And now they are coming to see you and they're also taking the, um, the bolus insulin, say Novolog or Humalog before meals. What do we need to do to convert? So first we want to identify the patients, like insulin resistance, more than 200 units or more than two units per kilogram. And then we have to look at two things. So once we have decided that the patient may benefit, then we have to look at two things. We have to know the total daily requirement of insulin based on the reg regimen that they are uh, that they are taking, the length is and the, you know, uh, uh, Novolog and Humalog dosing. And then we need to know their A1C. So those are the two things we need to know, total daily dose that they are taking and their A1C. So if suppose their A1C is under better control, but they're frustrated by the five injections that they're using, in that situation, if their A1C is less than eight, then we can reduce the total dose of U100 that they are taking by 20%. So if suppose they're taking a total of 300 units and their A1C is less than eight, then 20% will be about 60 units. So we will reduce the dose and we will divide the dose before meals, stop all U100 insulin and use that dose. If their A1C is between 8% to 10%, then it's a full conversion. So if they are taking 300, I'm just gonna divide it. Um, we maybe use 100, 100, 100 before meals. That is the start. We will stop again all U100 insulin in that situation. If their A1C is uncontrolled, which is mostly the case, and that's why we are seeing these patients, they're not happy, they think that the insulin, the U100 is not working. They will tell you that they inject, either the insulin leaks out, the blood sugars really don't come down. 
So in that situation, the raven C is high, and there here we will increase by 20%. So again, if the patient is using 300 units of total daily insulin, then 20% will be 60. So we will use 360 and use 20, uh, you know, 120 units of U500 before all meals. So this is the two things you need to remember here it is the total daily dose that the patient is on and their A1C and we adjust, we are, you know, go up on the dose, maintain the same dose when we are converting it or decrease it based on their A1C. Next slide. Okay. All right, so when we are dividing the dose, there are two things we can we can do. So if the, suppose we have we are looking at the patient and the patient is using total daily doses between 200 to 300 units of insulin a day. So the suppose suppose patient is using you know let's say 280 units in a day, then we can divide the injection. If you remember the pharmacokinetics of U500 insulin, it was lasting about 12, maybe 14 to 16 hours. We can divide the U500 insulin into just two injections a day or three injections a day. The star that, that you see here is the, for the three uh, injections, and that is actually superior than the two injections. But sometimes if the patient does not want to use more injections, you can actually divide the U500 insulin, whatever you have decided uh, to, to use, into just two injections before the biggest meals of the day. So maybe what we do normally is before breakfast, 60% of the total daily dose. Suppose we have decided to use 300 as a total dose that we're gonna be using based on the A1C and based on what they were using. So 60%, so that means 180 units before breakfast and the rest of the 120 units, which will be 40% of the total daily dose before dinner. And, but this will be 30 minutes because it takes 30 minutes for this medication to start getting absorbed into the system. So they have to take this injection 30 units before breakfast and 30 units before dinner. And we can skip the lunch, let the, um, the peak affect the lunch insulin. So that's one regimen. And the third, uh, the, the, the three injections that we can do when we do three injections, we divide the total daily dose into 40% at breakfast, 30% at lunch, and 30% of the total daily dose at dinner. The advantage is the disadvantage of using two injections. There was more hypoglycemia in the in the comparison trial, and um, um, the three injections worked better because there wasn't a very high peak, and therefore there was less hypoglycemia. So you can actually change from five injections to two injections and still get C and A1C improvement. Ideally, we should switch it to three injections. Okay. So, so that is one, but this is only when the patient is using about 200 to 300 units of insulin a day. Next slide. If your patient, and sometimes we see these patients is using a lot more insulin. So between 300 to 600 units a day, total daily dose, then dividing into three injections is probably the best option. Um, if they are between 200 to 300 units, then you can get away with two injections. But if they are between 300 to 600, then you have to use the three injections. And again, you divide 40% of the total insulin that you have decided that you want to use it before 30 minutes before breakfast, and then 30% of the total insulin before noon or before lunch, and 30% before supper. If the blood sugars are still running high in the morning, then in some situations, we actually add another injection at bedtime fourth injection, but I, you know, from experience, we, we very seldom, uh, you know, do it uh, for once. Anytime you get any insulin at bedtime, there's always a risk of hypoglycemia. So I will be reluctant to do that. So most of the time you can just ask your patients after you calculate their total daily requirements, to use three injections, 30 minutes before meals and divide the insulin. We want to give a higher dose, about 40% of the total daily requirement in the morning. 30% of the total requirement at lunch and 30% at supper. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, with this, um, I will come to the case and then here we will practice, you know, we will see um, in, in, in clinical situation, how can we use this kind of insulin and what kind of advantage, uh, you know, um, the patient will have. So. Uh, this is a patient, my patient in the clinic. Uh, we'll just say he's Mr. R. He's 42-year-old male, 15-year history of type 2 diabetes. He has failed glipizide treatment in the past. He is also intolerant to metformin. Um, you know, he, 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 metformin gives him diarrhea. 
He has been on insulin uh, for the last 10 years um, because the medications either he was not tolerating or his blood sugars were not controlled. And now he's on insulin. His current regimen at this time when he's coming to see you in the clinic is uh, he's on Lentis 80 units, two times a day. So that's 160 units of basal insulin. And he's also on Lispro, which is Humalog, 40 units <clears throat> before meals. So he's taking 160 plus 120. So that's what, 300 units of insulin he's taking. And his blood sugars are running between 250 to 300. He's checking it two times a day. Uh, he's not reporting any hypoglycemia. He's a bit frustrated with his reg regimen because he's injecting four, five injections, two lentis injections, three humalog injections. He's also not very happy with his blood sugars. He feels that they're running high. He's trying his level best. He weighs 280 pounds or 127 kilogram, which is important. And his most recent A1C is 8.3. Uh, um, you know, he doesn't have any kidney uh, function problems. His renal functions are fine. So his total, uh, sorry, his total requirement is 160 plus 120, which is, sorry, 280 units, not 300. So 100, uh, 280 units is his total daily dose. He weighs 127 gram, uh, kilograms. So that means he is taking more than 200 units, one, and he is on 2.2 units per kilogram per day. So is he, an, uh, is he a good candidate for U500 insulin conversion? Yes, because he's on five injections. He's using more than 200 units of insulin and his, um, he's using 2.2 units per kilogram per day. So this is the kind of patient where we can actually offer him uh, U500 uh, insulin because we know from the studies that there may be some improvement in A1C. We will certainly reduce his injection burden and of course, he will gain weight, like we, we discussed uh, in the previous slides. So, um, so you will. Uh, when, when I saw this patient, I brought up this option with him. He was already frustrated for the last ten years. He was using insulin, so he was he was interested in doing that. Next slide, please. Okay. So, the, what is the first step? When uh, so first we have identified the patient, right? The second, and we feel that he's a good candidate. The first thing, and this is probably the most important thing, their medical reconciliation sheet will tell you something, but is the patient really taking all five injections? Look, if I have to take five injections for the rest of my life, I will not take them. Most patients, no matter what they tell you, miss injections here and there, and this becomes important. So you ask the patient, is he really taking all five injections or is he missing the injections? Uh, I normally tell them, look, if I give you a large amount of insulin, there's a chance that I may cause hypoglycemia. I don't want to do that. So if they're missing any injections, please let us know so that we can make the calculation actually based on what they are taking. Um, and we can always titrate upward, but we don't want to start very high and have them, you know, and make them blood sugar drop. Number one, so I ask the patient, um, ask in a way that they don't feel that you are, you know, because these patients are already have seen a lot of uh, providers before they come to see you. So, so they have heard all those, those these questions. So you approach them in a nice way. You say, look, I don't want to cause hypoglycemia. I don't want to cause any problems. And that's why I'm asking this question. Then you review the injection technique, and that's very important. Are they hitting the scar tissue? Do they have areas of uh, lipohypertrophy from previous 10-year use of injections? Uh, so you always, I always try to make a, you know, I have a habit of feeling the areas to see, make sure that there is no scar tissue development there. And then um, are they using new syringe, new pen needle every time? Some patients use the same pen needle. Uh, either they're running out of it or they want to save money or, or, or whatever the reason is, but these are ultra fine nanoparticle needles. So if they, if they keep using the same needle, it will develop trauma, it will become blunt. And therefore the next time they use it, it will cause more scarring in the area. So ask them not only about the injections, but what they are doing with the pen needles that are in their insulin syringes. So that's, in my view, that's the most important thing, asking questions, doing the exam. Next slide, please. So, so he's doing, he's taking all five injections. He's a good patient. Occasionally he misses it, but that's my, like maybe once a week uh, or short acting insulin if he's traveling or anything. So we know that he's taking about 280 units. All right. So the second step is what is his A1C? We said that the, the A1C is between eight to 10. We will do dose to dose conversion. So this patient A1C is 8.3. So I don't need to reduce the dose. I mean, I can, if I have any doubts, 
but based on the the uh, uh, recommendations the guidelines we can just do dose to dose conversion so that means we have 280 units of u100 insulin that he's using and that's the insulin we're going to use in this situation next slide okay so the third step after we have the, all this information is i'm going to divide or i decided to divide his insulin which is the 280 units into three injections because we know that three injections are superior than two injections because it does not cause hypoglycemia and we said let's do 40% of your dose 30 minutes before breakfast which is 115 units i will uh, i decided 30% of the uh, total dose 200 units which is 85 units before lunch and again 85 units or 30% before dinner 30 minutes again this is important 30 minutes not 10 to 15 like we do with the other analog insulins so we said let's start with 115 units before breakfast 85 units before lunch 85 units before dinner i gave him the option of the pen as well as the green syringe with the green uh, vial he opted for the pen he because he was used to the pens so he started that and we all we talked about that we we expect even see improvement we expect some weight gain next slide please all right so this is i already said that so we did, these are the two options i normally carry these pens and the vials in the clinic and show it to them the green and again this is important uh, we we if they are going for the vial route we we talk about this green uh, pen and green vial and again he opted for uh, the u500 pen next slide Okay, so now he has started using it, and he has followed. He he sends his blood sugars in, and uh, we have titrated his insulin. And right now he's taking 130 units before breakfast, which is more than what we initially started. And he's taking 100 units before lunch, 30 minutes before, and 100 units before dinner. So he's so he's his insulin has actually gone up, and he's using a total of 330 units of U500 insulin. because he was gaining weight we discussed starting using a uh, uh, dulaglutide which is trulicity he started at a low dose and has titrated him up to 1.5 and this is because he was gaining weight so we tell the patients that look you may gain weight but we have other options which we can add and that will help with the weight gain and neutralize some of the weight gain that you may experience and reduce your insulin re resistance reduce your insulin requirements and now he his weight has actually come down to where we started almost the same although he initially he gained and it has come down and his most recent avnc is 6.6% remember he started from 8.3 so he has noticed about the 1.5% 1.6% uh, avnc reduction he's more he's he's happy that he is not using the five injections he's using three injections no significant hypoglycemia um, And and my plan is to titrate or keep titrating the dulaglutide, which is trulicity, and reduce the U500 insulin as he loses weight, and then maybe add an SGLT2 inhibitor. So we went from five injections to three injections with an A1C improvement. Um, and I think this is my last slide. Next slide, please. I think this is the last one. Okay. All right, go back please go to the slide so yeah that's where i think especially in patients who are obese and uh, are gaining weight this insulin has uh, a role uh, and you can certainly help your patients by reducing the injection burden and improve their a1c uh, getting yourself familiarized with this insulin and uh, be comfortable with in prescribing it is the first step i think that and the primary care physician certainly can use it you use if you're using 280 units of u100 insulin why can't you use the u500 Thank you so much Dr. Hader. That was really wonderful and super detailed. We really appreciate you presenting today. And I'll be sure to attach your uh presentation to the recap email so everyone has all the details of your PowerPoint as well. Um and thank you for the case as well. We always appreciate a little case uh within the didactics. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the group? Feel free to unmute, chat in. Carrie, I see. I'm not sure if that's the number you dialed in with, but I see you, you unmuted. Did you have a question or comment? No, I don't. Thank you. Sure, no worries. Anyone else? I see some more folks hopped on here. Dr. Polly Wall, thanks for hopping on as well. 
thank you for the presentation. Actually, I joined in midway, so I really need to hear the whole lecture, but I need to see that because this is one of the things that I'm uncomfortable with, with the insulin. So thank you so much. I will sure. get back to you if I have questions. Oh, please, please do. Thank you. Yeah. I would agree. I think I, I got definite food for thought here in terms of managing some of the uh, people who are more insulin resistant. Yeah. I'm sure you see a lot of patients who are on five injections in your practice and, and they're frustrated and their blood sugars are high and stuff. So I, I find this very rewarding when we see these patients and we switch and, um, you know, they appreciate after a while when they're, you know, their numbers improve and everything. Is it fairly well covered by insurance? It is actually, yes, uh, it is. It is, uh, you know, uh, especially with private insurances, of course, they can get the first prescription for three months for, for free. And then even with Medicare, and sometimes we have to write a letter of necessity and stuff, but it is uh, well covered. Well, that, that sometimes dictates what we prescribe, as you know. <laughs> that is absolutely correct, yeah. Thank you, uh, both Dr. Polywall and Dr. Rexford for the comments and positive feedback. And Dr. Polywall, I know you hopped on a little bit halfway, as you mentioned, so it's recorded on our YouTube if you want to watch back on that, um, and you'll have the PowerPoint in the recap email. And that goes for everyone. <laughs> Any other comments from the group? Maybe someone who has experienced this type of insulin and what your experience has been. Alrighty, no worries at all. I'll give you all about 15 minutes back to your afternoon. Thank you again so much. I have Dr. one question. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, this is unrelated. I um, mean, uh, in general, it's a question. Have you noticed um, cirrhosis affects insulin requirement or diabetes management as such? Uh, yeah, I think this is a very good question. Um, yeah, and, and, and the short answer is yes. Uh, the long uh, answer is the following, you know, look, these patients have ascites, right? Most cirrhotics have ascites, they can have tense ascites. So the volume of distribution is more, they have more fluid, and then the injection site, sometimes because of the tense societies, they will not absorb the insulin, especially if they are on higher doses. So because of the tense societies, they really cannot find the, the, that slab where they need to inject the, uh, the insulin. Plus liver itself plays a very important role in gluconeogenesis and makes glucose and release glucose. So these patients will have a liver that is really not functioning well. So their gluconeogenesis is affected of course, we cannot use certain medications in these patients. And then most importantly, and this is something that I have realized uh, with experience, that these patients are on lactulose. Now, lactulose has some uh, glucose or, or carbohydrate-like material, which causes, especially if they're using it multiple times a day, that causes the blood sugars to go high after using it. So again, insulin, you have to look at the injection sites, look at their medications, how bad their ascites is, and maybe in these patients, they ask them to inject their, you know, gluteal area or the leg, not so much stomach, especially uh, if they are not absorbing the insulin properly. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Polywall, for the question. Any other questions or thoughts? And as always, if uh, anyone thinks of comments or questions after the fact, you can always email us and I'll make sure to send it back to uh, any presenter that we have. So you can always email us as well. Alrighty, well, the only announcement that I have is that our next session will be on June 22nd and Dr. Barguthi will be presenting on approaches to non-specific symptoms. So, 
keep an eye out for that reminder and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you all and thank you, Dr. Hader so much. Thank Take you. care, everyone.